uh, I'm trying to hold this down to, you know, just a, a, a Zoom time period. I don't want to go any further than that. But uh, in, instead of our, our normal talking about like new releases and all that good stuff, um, we were talking about uh, the business, the business side. Um, you know, I made that uh, suggestion that 30% is basically, you know, working on your music and your craft and then performing it. But the 70% is on the other side about how to navigate the business, how to make sure you get booked, um, how to, you know, keep your positive spirit up, you know, yeah. and, and, and keep trudging along and make sure, you know, sometimes you're like, as anyone, you know, I'm working really hard on this. And then you go out and you're like, okay, where are the people to embrace me? Where's that love? So, yeah, yeah. So, so there's a, a, a lot to, to go. I have 10 artists that have, have uh, committed to it. You're number four. So, mm -hmm. so I appreciate you doing it. Um, my whole thing for you is that you are like, I do uh, pay attention to you probably more than you think. And you're traveling all the time. Plus, plus you work at the Peabody plus uh, you know, you're out like gigging around in this area and you have kids and you, they're younger. So how do you like navigate all that thing? How, you know, you're always on the road. Um, Honestly, a big part of that goes to my wife. Uh, I think if you're in a situation like I am and many others are, if you have somebody who's supportive and understand what the life of, of an artist is like, uh, things can work. But a, a typical schedule for me, you know, at least when I'm home, um, say, for instance, because I only work at Peabody mainly on Monday and Tuesdays. So we'll all everybody in, in the household will wake up at six o'clock uh, a.m., maybe five thirty. And um, from there, we start getting the kids ready for the, for school. That that whole process right there takes about 45 minutes. Once that's over, we, you know, my wife takes them to the bus stop. Um. And then she goes to work because she's an artist. She's a a, a, a professional dance teacher. Um, and then normally after that is when, uh, I mean, outside of the exercise stuff, you know, we I go straight to Peabody and I'm working there pretty much, say, on Monday, like all day. Uh, Tuesdays, maybe half the day. Um, but, you know, say on that Tuesday, if it's a half a day, I will come home. I pick up the kids and it's time to do homework with them, you know, just all, all the stuff that, that we typically have to do as parents. But at the same time, I still have to keep my stuff up, you know, uh, scheduling wise, practice wise, emails, returning phone calls, same thing with my wife. So we're juggling all the stuff at the same time. But we, we find a way to make it work. I mean, we've been doing this now for almost 12 years. So I think we got a hold of it. <laughs> uh, Mac Avenue is your label that you use. And I think a lot of artists or, or a lot of people who are, are no, go oh he's on a label they think they're setting up all your you know your concerts they're setting up all your um yeah you know, your public uh things they're setting up your studio time um what what's the involvement with that label so interestingly enough i'm no longer with mac avenue well, there you go <laughs> i have um fulfilled my contract which was uh five records my fifth and final record with that company was the uh christmas record that came out a couple years ago um, but no, I mean, just in general, though, you know, for the record companies, their main job, at least nowadays, I've heard stories about how it was in the nineties, you know, when they were, give, they were given tour support and the, uh, the advance for some of these records were just insane. You know, some of these, for jazz musicians, a lot of guys were getting 60, $70,000 advance and that just doesn't happen anymore. You know, you don't see really tour support and things like that. You know, the record labels, they just come right out and they, they'll they sign you and, and they'll, you know, you put a record out for them. You have, you, depending if you have somebody working for you, you know, you have your spreadsheet and then you figure out how to divide the money between every little thing that's come, that's happening when you're recording. Um, and, you know, yeah, it's a budget there. <laughs> yeah. They work, so you have to work with and they want their money back eventually. So Mac Avenue does do some promotion work. They or they they reach out to uh, groups that that are will have have you available to be interviewed. Well, they or... do have promotion. Like for they they work with a company called uh, DL Media that was based out of Philadelphia. DL Media stands for God. The the owner name was Don Lukoff. Um, and pretty much uh, whenever I 
me or anybody else was on that label, like Christian McBride, Kenny Garrett, Danilo Perez, all of these guys, whenever we uh, finished the record, when it came time for the press, they would send all of the stuff over to DL Media. And then DL Media would, uh, you know, set up some type of interview with you, get the background on the whole story, and then they'll, you know, just print it up all, make it look nice. They'll um, figure out your tour dates was coming up, and they'll send, like, a big email blast out to however many people follow them <laughs> okay so there uh, are you comfortable without a label or are you uh are you I'm comfortable i mean because I, i've done this before mm-hmm. um so i like for instance right now i'm currently working on my my next record this will be record number 10 the first two the first and the fourth record that i've had in my discography are all self-produced so I've been down this road before. The two the two records, like number two and three, are Japanese imports. Yeah. So again, first record is myself, two or three Japanese imports. Number four, another self-produced by myself. And then the uh, following five after that. I said, is this record number 11? Yeah. Wait, am I saying this right? Five. No, this would be 10. Okay. So that, that's four. That's two self-produced, two Japanese Five magnums. So this would be number ten. So you, um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So this one. Uh, um, I mean, the, the, I, I would say the, the the hard thing about it, but it's actually not too bad of a, you know, issue, is when you're self producing, you you just you have to handle all of the costs yourself. Um, I mean, I know a lot of people do those uh, fun drives. You know, to have other people, um, pay for it for them. Because they maybe they don't have the financial, but I don't really like doing that. I mean, I I typically save for for um stuff like that. So you know, I just come out of my own pocket and pay for it. You know, recordings don't have to be expensive. A lot of people like to use the biggest, most expensive studios there is, and I'm just like, well, in my opinion, it's all about how you get it mixed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. It, it has a, a big difference. We just did a a, a show with Peter Gabriel. Uh, mm-hmm. The Snow album. We went through his album. He had uh, his studio in a barn, like in one in the just the one one studio area. The other side was a chill side, like another a part of it. It was the mix that made the difference. So definitely, definitely. yeah, yeah. It, it it wasn't the the quality of the studio or the space. Mm-hmm. Uh, so okay, as, as someone who's young, you know, they had you have now. You've seen both. You've seen the label side. You've seen the independent side. Uh, I think any any uh, artist that starts out would love to be connected to a, a label. At least they feel they're secure. So, yeah. that what do you feel that you would say to someone who's no like do it independent, and just uh, keep it going? Or uh, I'm, I'm sure there's pros and cons on both sides. There there are definitely pros and cons on both sides. If a I'm thinking about my students, if if a student came up to me and said you know, I've been offered this record deal. Should I take it? I mean, first of all, number one, I'm going to tell them read the contract all the way and get a good lawyer, Um, you know, because there's a lot of things in there that, you know, people just sign and they don't look at. Um, But then there are other like type of labels, say, for instance, there's this one jazz label called Criss Cross. I don't think he really, that guy, well, he, he uh, is he a Gary or Jerry Teakins? I think. Teakins is the last name, but I can't remember if it's Jerry or Gary. But uh, as far as I know, he didn't really want anything from him. He just wanted to record like some of the best musicians possible. Um, and he just paid everybody a flat a flat fee. And that was it. So um, I don't really know how many people are actually just doing straight record contracts now. You know, I, I recall uh, Maria Schneider, she coming up with her artist share group and then I remember Prince was saying that the record companies are, are pretty much useless. Um, you know, a lot of people are just doing it by themselves now. I mean, everybody has like home studios and things like that. So I can't say if it's good or not. I mean, if you if you get that, cool. I think it's fine. You get to record, you get that experience. But I guess on... I don't know if I want to call this negative or not, but you know, the record company will own your masters. <laughs> yeah. And oh. um, like I said, I mean, if they give you a certain amount, I mean, it's, it won't be like it was in the nineties, but 
you know, some records nowadays, they a company may say, hey, we'll we'll budget you for ten or fifteen thousand dollars. But again, they they want that back. They gotta recoup that somehow. Yeah. So but that then that goes along with recouping, that goes into the whole other side of business, like far as uh um who are you building your package? <laughs> Which a lot of musicians don't understand yet. <laughs> Your target audience, like who's your target, like who's your everything target audience, like how do you build yourself? Because a lot of musicians are just thinking like notes wise, like, oh, I can play. I'm mm-hmm. like, yeah, you can play, but that person can play too. So I try to tell a lot of my students and just people in general, what you tell me something that is special about you. If if you're, if I'm a club promoter or a concert promoter, why should I book you? Mm-hmm. Just because you can play. You know what you, the whole package has to come in hand. Like, why would the average person on the street just want to come see you play? This is all just my opinion, by the way. So, yeah. I mean, do you have historical data and say, look, these are the rooms that I played before? This is. Do you have like percentage of if they were sold out? Blah blah blah. Do you give them yeah. that and say I could sell out a room? I wouldn't necessarily say that, but you know, I mean, I think today with the with social media, I mean, all of that stuff just helps so much because. You know, a lot of people, well, for me, I stay very active on there and I like to build my fans that way. Um, You know, I would say back when I first came out 20 years ago, it was a little bit harder. But uh, I don't know. I just think the whole social media aspect really helps out. You know, I was talking to a friend recently. He he told me he um, I won't say his name. but He said he's coming out with a record. He, he just finished recording the record. So I asked him, I was like, so what are you going to do as far as promoting it? How are you going to get gigs? And he said, man, just watch. I'm going to get gigs. I said, but man, nobody knows anything about you. You know, what are you just going to put a record out with, with no, he does he didn't do any type of videos in the studio to cap capture what was happening that day. Nothing, no pictures or nothing. He just went straight like rogue, like, like old school jazz. Like, okay, we're just going to record and this is going to be great. But yeah. I told him, I said, listen, sometimes I think, you know, everybody's musicians we have to treat this like as if say like the movies you know when a brand new movie is, is about to come out there's always the trailer and that's what get people like oh man that's that's gonna be happening yeah i can't wait to see that i think we have to treat it the same way in music so yeah well i mean especially since okay I, there is no tower record so like i would go there at least two times a week Definitely. And i would see i'd see the new release board and i knew what would hit on tuesday and I, you know, I was ready on Thursday to buy it, blah, blah, blah. So yeah. you had all that. But now, you know, there's like, oh, wow, they had an album. I didn't even know it came out. And that was like a year ago. I'm, I'm missing uh, releases because of the uh, the way things are set up right now. There is no yeah. central place to get your info. Well, I'll tell you, that's the only time I really find out about new records, like in in, in great detail, at least when it comes to jazz stuff, is if I'm looking at a downbeat magazine or jazz times that's like one of the main reasons why i like to subscribe to those magazines so i can see what's out every now and then because i i'm one of the uh i'm sure there's a lot of people who do this but i know for myself when it comes to purchasing music i actually purchase music i don't actually, i don't stream anything so i go on to um you know apple music and i always go to the new releases in in many styles of music and i'd like to see because it says it right there the new release and i'll, I'll check it out um, I will say I'm I'm probably guilty of not buying the whole record. <laughs> However, at least I'm buying something. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. That's what I was gonna ask you. I said, are you getting vinyl or are you getting like the the hard copy? Nah, uh, I I I just I just download everything on the phone. I I have a CD player upstairs. Uh, and I definitely do not have any uh, record players in the house. So vinyl is out for me. Yeah. Yeah, if you look at uh, Soundgarden locally, there it's all a vinyl shop now. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're the word groomer is is a really bad word now because I think the Republicans took it. But um, you're you have been groomed, and your story is really interesting. I'm gonna tell everyone that if they listen to the the, the first interview, maybe even the second interview that I did of you, you get a little more information that your 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 father was a musician, your mom became a musician by proxy. And and uh, he had suggested that you get in the business, so you really had uh, an opportunity to see what that business was like when you were young. So when you got older, that transition from like 
you know, no one in my business family is has an idea as to how to be in the business. I just am a good musician. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you had that that ability to kind of see the business as you grow up and and, and uh, see how you fit in that and make good connections. So yeah, we're going yeah. back, we're going back into you're already out you're out of high school you you're or just and you're going into to that next level. Of where do you feel that uh, was it an easy transition? What what were the stumbling blocks that you kind of had? A transition from you know just being like you were you were a student you were at home you're practicing you're getting a good reputation for for your work and now you're you you're identifying like this is, could be a career for me because yeah. at the time you were said you weren't even sure if that's something you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. I mean, I can't say it was easy or hard. I mean, I just kind of just went went with it and just to see what will happen. You know, I've, I recall many times uh, one of my best friends was telling me recently, he said, Warren, you've always been that person to, you know, say you're not sure if you wanted to do this full time. You know, my, my late mother used to tell me every year in January, she used to say, you know, you always worry every January, like because you don't see your calendar full. She said, you're one of the most talented people I, you're, I know. And she was like, she said, I'm not saying this because you're my son. It's the truth. You'll be fine. But coming from high school to college, I didn't really have any stumbling blocks. I was just trying to figure out where my place was. Um, and I wasn't quite sure what that was. Um, and nor was I really trying to find out at the moment. Mm -hmm. Back then, I, I was just trying to play with any and everybody. And that was the goal. I wasn't really worried about trying to get gigs so much. I mean, if, if one came my way, I would gladly take it. But that wasn't the goal. I, I just wanted to learn as much as I can. I want I wanted to play with seasoned musicians who would not necessarily give me lessons, but people who, who would just take me under their wing and I would just learn from them on the bandstand. Did you ever like go after someone and say, hey, I really like to learn from you? Or was it just more organic? Just more organic. Yeah. I've I've never approached I I never approached anybody if that's what you mean by like just actually like I want to learn from you. Can we sit down and spend an hour and for lessons? I've I stopped doing that in college. <laughs> <laughs> uh I got great verification from my teacher, the the late great Dave Samuels, who I I studied with him for seven of eight semesters, but the lessons, the actual like like you should do this or play this wrong, play this right note, whatever. That stopped in my first year. Okay. The lessons with me and Dave were more like he's gonna show me material that he knew would kick my butt. Yes. So after that, you know, it was pretty much already said and done. It's like a lot of people, including himself, knew that I could play, but I just still needed to be seasoned more. You know, there's a certain level, at least how I look at a lot of musicians, it's like there's I was right in that middle level, maybe slightly above the middle le level. It's like you could put any type of music in front of my face. I could play it. But I guess the next level is, as in one of my friends in L.A., he said his name is Jacques Lejour. He's a guitarist. He says, you have to own the song. And he said, he was like, I feel worn now. That He was like, you do that on everything. You you play every single song as if you own it. So that was that was always just my mindset. Your your main I mean I've seen you play piano I've I know that the vibes are your your main uh you know uh, instrument and you know if I look back at jazz and just you know it seemed like it was really hot the vibes were hot in the fifties and sixties and had a cool sound like it was yeah. almost with that the um, the swinger sound of jazz you know in the sixties so it was kind of it was kind of the main thing but then it died died out I think around the eighties like you don't really see too many uh artists and then you're coming up did you feel like wow maybe playing an instrument that might not catch on or did you feel wow there's no one else doing it and i do it better than anyone else and i i can get right in there was there any kind of thought about that i always thought that i could get right in there um i can actually well i don't know if i should say this but i know i can say it because he's not here anymore uh, he isn't my father um there was this I, i'll tell you what i'm gonna say i'm gonna say it in the nice way but there was a point in time, I think in the eighties, like the 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 main two vibes player who, vibes players who were really on the scene were um like between Joe Locke and uh, Steve Nelson. 
of course, there were the other guys were still playing, like Dave and Mike Maneri and all those guys. Um, but those are like the two new younger guys. So the nineties, there was like this big gap yeah. with that instrument. And my father in his mind, because I mean, he, my father just looked at me like he was like, I was just the next, the next one. Like this, this guy, my, my son has it. He was pretty pissed off once he started to see Stefan Harris's name. Uh, you got, he's older than you, isn't he? Maybe about like three or four years. Okay. Yeah, no, he 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 blew up right away, real fast. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and that could I mean he's a very talented player. He's he's a great player, great composer, everything about Stefan. I really love. But I I no, it's not even a butt to it. Maybe it could have been also like, wow, there's been this gap on this instrument, and then we have somebody else who's brand new coming out. He's young, you know, he's quick, great hands, everything. So he just took it. And my dad was already always ha- held a little animosity toward that, but you know, <laughs> he he was like, "It's okay, you know, your time will come." Yeah, and well, that's just 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 what it was. Well, then I was right. There there was a decline I, in my mind. There was a big decline in that, and and I knew that when Stefan came out, he got lumped in called the Young Guns, where you know it was like the the Sean Jones and the. Uh, Oh God, the other ones that the 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 um, Terrence Blanche or time period yeah, yeah. where where they they were all they all kind of rise up at the same time. They had a cool look. They were young and they were kind of twisting the jazz genre to mm-hmm. take a, a newer sound. And he his album covers were cool. His you know he was connecting with uh, uh, good people and and uh, he just kind of fell into that category. You yeah. know, do you feel like Baltimore would be a back? Uh, because it's not a major market, would that be a reason that maybe it, that would would hinder you from being that per, that first person to break through? I don't think so. Um, you mean you mean to break through to what? Well, your 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 dad. I'm going to tell your uh, your dad is equally right. There's no <laughs> he. Uh, you know you you uh, you have the talent. It's just a matter of like Stefan got there first, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, do you think that like living in Baltimore, you know, you you own your zip code that you live in, you know, they say, oh, you're you're as famous as you are as your zip code or, or professionally sound mm-hmm. financially. D- does living in Baltimore, it's, since it's not a major market, is would would that be a hindrance that that would help to decrease your 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 movement? No, right? I don't think so at all. Uh, number one, as you just said, I think it helps far as at least in this area. Like one of my ex-manager said he was like man warren you need to own not just baltimore you need to, when it comes to jazz in in maryland or the, or the dc maryland virginia dmv you should be the guy but yeah. at the same time you know um i've always wanted to be bigger than than just this area as much as i love the area my mentality has always been play the hell out of the instrument to the point where people will call you regardless of where you live yeah. And that's always been my mindset, you know, because, yes, I play the vibes. Well, I'm just going to stick with that instrument. Yes, I play the vibes. And be, people in New York could easily just call Stefan or Joe Locke or some of the other young vibraphone players who are younger than me. But it, if I'm going to play the instrument to that highest level, you know, I want them to be able to say, you know what, I, I want Warren so bad that I'm willing to rent an instrument pay for his travel and put him up in a hotel, <laughs> you know, versus what they could do to call somebody else. They don't have to do all of that. So yeah, my mentality has always been to conquer. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, there's a, 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 I interviewed uh, Oren Evans and mm-hmm. he was like, Oh, Philly kind of, he's kind of like in that time period of the young guns and he stayed in Philly. And he said, if I felt, if I, he was up in New York, he got married, he moved down to Philly. That's where, you know, he's from, he said that, that he really feels that he missed the step with all those other guys. He, if he was up in New York, he would have been lumped into that group because he would have oh. been working with them. Like what he would be seeing them on a daily basis. They would be gigging. They'd be, you know, in the clubs in New York and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of believe that. I mean, that the same could be with any other scene. Like for instance, like outside of jazz, I really thought I was going to be on the LA scene you know, just more into like pop and production and, and stuff like that. But, and don't get me wrong. A lot of those folks out there know me, but they're not going to call because I'm just out here. Yeah. And New York is a lot closer for me. So I'm just going to 
I got to take what I can get at the moment, you know? So, I mean, if I were to ever to make that move out there, which I'm not, but if I ever were, you know, I would start going slowly to the point where people will recognize and say, wait, you're out here now. Okay. We'll give you some goals. But yeah. I, that's, I get it with Orrin, you know, I be, truly believe, I mean, he's up there a lot anyway, but you know, yeah, he's, in the, he's, to, he's in the man. Yeah. He's if he was just living there, it could have been a lot more, but he's made it work. He has had, what 25 records as a leader and he's multiple grammy nominations yeah. so he he's making making it well and he's one of those guys like you just said he owns the the, the uh the zip code yeah like philly is his thing but people know him well well out of that <laughs> yeah. yeah now he's cool like when i i worked at live at the world cafe part-time and i would see him uh play at the live at the world K- cafe second floor on mondays and i changed mm-hmm. my schedule so i could just get right out there and, and check him out so I feel like I have like, uh, like I've been a fan of his for like I don't know since the '90s. So it, it yeah, feels, yeah. yeah, big fan. Um, we went all over the place. You know, you have to thank your mom because I do see your calendar. Uh, she'd she'd be proud of you. You are always on the move, and uh, your dad would be proud of you. And I was proud of you when I saw you do uh, uh, live at Emmett's place. I think you killed it. Um, mm-hmm. I'm a big I'm a big fan. I just released an interview with Emmett um that that was like a breakthrough vibe that happened during the pandemic that was really necessary in the jazz community and you just came on with the coolest shirt ever and you were you were just like uh, it was such an entertaining show um uh, it was it's great uh so your mom and dad should be really proud of what you're doing Thank we're, you. we're kind of winding down so and, and uh, the thing i wanted to talk about is you are vocal on uh um uh, online so i do hear like you make some comments because I think you're dealing with kids, you know, kids that are musicians. You have you have thoughts that are a little different than what theirs are. You're you're making observations. What would you recommend that uh, kids do? I mean, one of the things that I know that you suggest is that a lot of kids are don't want to reach back to the past to learn about music. They want to uh, maybe think it's boring, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. but, but that's one of the suggestions that you have made. But there, I'm sure there's more out there. Well. That's something I'm really still dealing with. You know, sometimes they say as an educator, yes, I am the guy and multiple others. We're in charge. We tell the kids what to do. But at the same time, I learned a lot from the kids because I like to see what's in their minds. But I'm always kind of going to go back to, you know, we should learn these standards. We should learn these old school tunes. But that does not necessarily mean that you have to have a, you have to do that once you finish. You use, I mean, because I, this, I guess, because I listen to some a, a wide variety of music. There's so many artists out here, and they don't consider themselves necessarily jazz musicians. But when you hear them play, you can obviously hear the jazz background. It's like, okay, you guys are not playing these complex chords or these ideas just because you're naturally talented. Obviously, you checked out some stuff. You played some stuff, and you know I just try to get my kids to, to understand that they should really just spend time on learning, uh, like say the many variations of Herbie, the many variations of Miles Davis. They should learn Oscar Peterson. They should learn about the like the correlation. How like how does uh Jack Deason that how does he relate to Dennis Chambers? How how does Ray Brown can possibly relate to uh, you know, somebody in Earth, Wind, and Fire. I forget the bass player name. You know, I mean, it's all this stuff kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah. Um, just learning about groove, different types of rhythm. There's just there's just so much a wide variety of music. Um, that all the kids can learn. It doesn't necessarily have to be jazz. They can be learning Chinese music, Japanese music, Indian music, and see how all of that stuff just relates. So, a lot of kids nowadays, they, you know, <laughs> one of my friends said this. They made it kind of quite clear. A lot of kids, they want to just like learn stuff that people who are like, say, like four years older than them. So they said, all right, let's use this analogy. If you were learning, this was actually Christian Scott. He said, this. we were on the, uh, the Blue Note Cruise. He said, it. he said, if you want to learn Kung Fu. Would you go to some young guy who's five years older than you? Or would you rather go study with Bruce Lee if he was still here? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, let's go to Bruce Lee. So, you know. We learn that stuff from Bruce Lee will probably teach you aspects of today, but he's going to take you back to the ancient traditions of how to learn that form and, you know, pull you up to date. So 
I, I actually think that uh, time started for early musicians at uh, D'Angelo's Voodoo album. Like, mm -hmm. like no one go like they don't want to go back any further than that. Like that's that's the where they start and then they continue. And I don't, I don't know. But why. you know, it was weird. Somebody, a lot of people might consider that album like super old now. Yeah, it, was, it probably is. What is it, 20 years old? But Over than that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's such a great piece of record where, you know, especially horn players. Horn players nowadays, they'll hear that and they be like, oh, man, I'm, I'm going to just do horn section work off. And that's Which is fine, but, you know, I stay. But the ones who want to actually just deal with, like, serious improv, you know, they, they I really think they just got to check out everything. I'm going to stick with my guns on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, even uh, Emmett Cohn, who his first single was a, a stride record. And he yeah. said that the, the feedback that he had about stride. And I said, well, he goes, this is my first stride song I ever did. I'm like, really? Because mm. that was, that to me seems like a really cool thing. It would be a part of your whole training in college is that you would have to learn that because it's really, really important to the. You should. I've yeah. coming up as a kid, I learned how to play stride. My dad taught me a, uh, Ragtime. I did. I did a, an entire book of Scott Joplin. Yeah. And then at the same time, you know, we would go and learn something by Art Tatum, and then Oscar Peterson, then Chick, Herbie, and you you kind of mesh all of that stuff together, and out will come something. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I, I guess you know, also for the thing is that you want to be picked up on as many gigs as possible. So you want to be as versatile as possible. If they yeah. throw back. Uh, 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 an oldie you want to make sure that you you're prepared for it like you, know, you can handle it without looking at and if you can do it without sheet music it's even better mm -hmm. yeah there's feel more Very comfort yep. yeah we are at that point uh it's called do the hustle we're talking to musicians behind the scenes of of how they handle their business uh you know i think a lot of people like musicians or who are not musicians just think, hey, this is really easy. Just come out and play, <laughs> but <laughs> no. but it's a it's a full time gig. In fact, it's twenty four seven, and you know social media, uh, you know making sure your bookings are right, make sure you're out there connecting the people that you're you're uh, uh, the people are aware of your product and that you're there. It's all time consuming. It's yes, indeed, and it's not like a what it was. It wasn't that even the time period of like voodoo, like the the way that they handled that album release. Is completely different than how you have to handle your album releases. Yes, indeed. Yep. Yeah. Any final words? I got like five minutes. Uh, just keep practicing and listen to as much stuff. You kind of said it. Listen to as much music as you can. Be versatile and everything because you never know who's going to call, and you don't. You 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 just want to be ready for all calls. Yeah. You know the the one thing that I I don't know why this isn't happening. So Prince, uh, the the Minneapolis scene was hot because there was a group of musicians that are really tight together. Uh, uh, there's uh, the James Brown time period where people were all together, like in the in the same area in Ohio. Um, there there's pockets where people were just really tight together, like that whole Philly sound with the with the roots and time period. Like, yeah. why why doesn't people see? Hey, we need to create collectives. We need a Baltimore collective where you have twenty or thirty people who are all in and they're able to create and, and to entertain. It. And then 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 with as a group collective that um like really cool things come out of it. Yeah. I don't know. Sean Jones is already on something like that. You know, maybe we that can always expand. I need to I need to hit him up for part two. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. I know he's been working on it for a while. That was his yeah. idea. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right, good. Well, Warren Wolf, thank you for joining me today on Something Came From Baltimore, the Do the Hustle edition. We love love having you. We're going to send this out basically today or tomorrow, so people are going to see your smile face. Okay. Uh, and then the, the show actually will air sometime in May. Sounds okay. good. Awesome. All right. Thanks, thanks for your help. Yep. You got it. Yep. Thank you, bro. Yep. You have a good day.